Hey everybody, let's talk about coastal agencies and introduce you to various uh, agencies that influence the management of our coast. There's a huge soup of acronyms and, and phrases and uh, official names and unofficial names for all these organizations. So I mostly want to just expose you to the range um, that we have uh, operating in and around California. It's important to say that any agency can impact coastal management, but we're going to focus here on ones that have a direct impact on coastal management. This is not always true, but this is kind of, it, it tends to be the case, which is if we have a well-funded local agency, they tend to cover fewer domains and tend to be more specialized and therefore um, uh, for example a, a, a focus on the coast for example or the ocean um, as we get to more regional or state agencies they don't always have that ability to be as specialized and they tend to be less focused on any one particular region or community um, and then by the time we get to the feds you can get both so feds can be either that sort of amorphous big grab bag or can be highly specialized. So here's my uh, little breakdown in terms of uh, where things fall. Now, the era of the world that we're in right now, nation states really run the show. So pretty much national governments or federal governments in our case um, are the main, uh, the main entity from which other things derive. Um, we can talk about intergovernmental collaborations. Um, those uh, may have direct impact on the management. They may not. Um, and then we can talk about uh, the next level we typically think about as a state level. However, we do have some interstate compacts that can be quite important, which is not exactly the state level, not exactly federal level, somewhere in between. Uh, but, but, but then we have the state level, um, special districts, um, which are kind of the state, kind of less than the state, um, and then uh, county and uh, uh, the city or town um, governance. So yeah, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go the reverse here. So I'm gonna start at the bottom of the slide and work our way back up in terms of talking about things. So local agencies, uh, there's a whole variety of these. Examples of these include watershed protection districts, which is what we refer to our district as in Ventura County, but um, other counties for, for the similar type of action uh, and, and challenge and management would talk about flood control districts. Uh, we can talk about vector control districts, things that control um, disease vectors, mosquitoes, uh, things of that nature, agricultural pests, etc. Then we have harbor and port districts and uh, air and water districts. Um, which are the sort of local arms of, of state agencies. That's why I have an asterisk, but we'll just say that. Um, resource conservation districts, county agricultural offices, sanitation districts, etc. Now, going forward here, the gray are agencies that um, may impact the coast or ocean, um, but also, you know, behave, act in areas beyond, outside the coastal zone. The um, beige guys are ones that operate prim either 100% or primarily focus on coastal uh, zone uh, issues and, and jurisdictions. Uh, special districts, just a, a quick side note about special districts, since these are something you guys seem to not uh, encounter too often, or at least you're not aware of encountering them too often. These are, um, uh, there's something like 38,000 special districts across the United States. We have more than something like, I think, I don't remember, 5,000 or something like that in, in the state of California. These are a whole variety of things. Now, these uh, can, uh, we first talk about special districts as dependents. These can be, I should say, all of these things fall under California state law in our state. They all fall under the state law. And so they're, they're applicable to sunshine rules, uh, uh, meeting, uh, public meeting rules, all that kind of stuff. But they have a couple different flavors. One is independent uh, special districts, and one is a dependent special district. Now, these special districts are operating at a level different than the city or the county 
or the state. So there, if it's uh, by definition, if it's within the state, it's less than the entirety of the state. Um, it, it could be um, our county plus another county, for example, or, or, or areas in our county versus another county. Um, it could be areas within the county. It could be a part of a city and not part of another, uh, and not another part, of, not the entirety of the city. So we basically have uh, independent and dependent special districts. Independent districts are governed by, governed by uh, an autonomous board of appointed or elected folks that are separate from the city or county um, uh, uh, political uh, operation. An example of that is the Port Wainimi um, Oxnard Harbor District, which is has its own elected folks, so it's it's, its own um, governance structure. Um, and does this do? In contrast, something like the Rancho Simi uh, Recreation and Park District is also a special district, but it is heavily managed. It, it is it is directly under the control of um, the folks in Rancho Simi, the governance in, in Rancho Simi. Um, and so the, the city appoints people, the city contributes um, uh, budgets and all that kind of good stuff. Funding for special districts can either be enterprise or non-enterprise. So the Port Wainimi example, that district is an enterprise one. So they're raising revenue from uh, vessels that come into the harbor, etc. So it's essentially run like a business versus non-enterprise are what most of our special districts are. So they're getting some, generally speaking, some small amount of the taxes from within their um, spatial jurisdiction. And that's what their operating budget comes from. So those are special districts. They're, again, not um, not necessarily state, uh, state. Well, they're definitely less than the state. Um, sometimes more than county or local, they're kind of a weird mix. Turning to state agencies, we have several state agencies. Again, reminding you here, the gray are individuals that are primarily focused across a region, not necessarily in the coastal zone. The beige text here and in, in going forward is, uh, is an agency that focuses primarily in the coastal zone. Okay, so we have our state, uh, so going from the top here, our state lands commission. This is an entity that uh, controls, as it sounds like, state lands. So controls, um, so is the entity that would lease uh, land to a, 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 an operation, to a business, what have you. Um, in our cases, uh, there are, they often come up when um, someone wants to run a pipeline, say from an oil platform to shore, you have to lease the seabed, for example, where that pipeline will reside, and the State Lands Commission is the entity that, that controls those leases. Next, a uh, really important uh, agency for us, the Ocean Protection Council. So this is a state-level entity um, that was created about 20 years ago um, and uh, really has sort of authority over many uh, much of the research and much of the sort of creation of policy on the immediate coastal zone near shore. Uh, they are oftentimes tightly associated with the Ocean Science Trust, but that was which was created at the same time. But that's actually a 501. That, that's an that's a nonprofit organization that was birthed by the state of California, but it's not it's it's not a state agency. That's why I have it in italics. But but. Oftentimes, the Ocean Science Trust interacts heavily and frequently and deeply with the Ocean Protection Council. Next, we have the Coastal Commission. More on that uh, in a separate discussion. Uh, fantastically important agency, the agency that the United Nations claimed is the most powerful land management agency in the world. Uh, and, uh, and they have uh, control over the immediate coastal zone. Uh, other agencies impact uh, our coast, like the Food and Agricultural uh, uh, Department of Food and Agriculture, which is usually just referred to as CDFA. Um, Department of Transportation, we usually refer to that as Caltrans. Business and Economic Development, um, which we don't typically think of as, as impacting the coast, perhaps the highest profile um, uh, influence these folks have is in bringing and encouraging folks to come to our coastal zone. 
via the Office of Tourism. Similar to um, the Ocean Protection Council, Ocean Science Trust, um, there's also uh, Visit California, which is now an independent nonprofit, um, but they interact tightly with the Office of Tourism. Uh, then, of course, we have the uh, California State Environmental Protection Agency, which, usually, which is usually referred to as Cal EPA. They have about seven different major divisions. Um, probably the most important ones for us in terms of the coastal zone are the Office of Health Hazard Assessment, um, the uh, Department of Toxic Substances Control, or DTSC, and then the Water Boards and the Air, uh, the wa State Water Board and the State Air Board. Uh, now, the Water Board and the Air Board are interesting in that they have a bit of a different structure than many of our uh, uh, agencies. They have this sort of master mothership um, called the State Board, either the State Water Board or the State Air Board, or CARB. We usually refer to the Air Board as uh, California Air Resources Board. An um, incredibly powerful organization, particularly in dealing with uh, uh, carbon emissions and, uh, and particulates and things like that. Um, but anyway, both of these um, uh, agencies have this master across the whole state uh, control, but how they really act is through a series of um, subdivisions. So the state is carved up. In terms of air districts, there's many more air districts. There's, there's fewer water districts. Um, we, uh, for our water district, we're, we are in um, uh, District 4, um, and so we're managed uh, holistically in terms of our, our water flows and things of that nature. The air districts are a bit different. They're, they're really managed based on more on air sheds. Um, and so we're in uh, our, our agency, our air district is essentially the same as our county border. But if you look just to the right over here, you'll see that the, the most important uh, air district, which is, uh, has incredible power and incredible um, technological sophistication is the South Coast um, uh, Air District. And that is the one that really sets the tone for a lot of uh, environmental monitoring in terms of coastal air sheds, et cetera. Um, and and we, we, we use them a lot also in terms of, even though we work with Ventura, uh, often our, our, our technical guidance will come from the South Coast. Okay. Then we have sort of the, the, the massive mothership of the state of California um, Natural Resource Management, which is the Natural Resources Agency. This is really a parent agency that oversees a whole bunch of, um, of uh, daughter agencies, if you will. Uh, most important here would be the Coastal Conservancy. This is not the Coastal Commission, often confused with the Coastal Commission, but the Coastal Conservancy is the entity that's going to provide, uh, primarily they act by providing funding to do uh, land acquisition, to do restorations, to do stuff like this. So they're, they're, they're actually building things or, or providing the resources to build things. Then we have obviously Department of Fish and Wildlife. Now this used to be called um, Fish and Game and everybody still pretty much refers to them historically as Fish and Game. Um, uh, under Governor Jerry Brown, he changed the name from Fish and Game thinking with the idea that game refers to uh, critters that we, uh, terrestrial critters that we kill um, and say, no, 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 it's about managing stuff uh, even if we don't kill it. And so uh, he pushed the change of the term fish and wildlife. Well, you know, intellectually that's that's valid. Um, it has caused a problem because we used to refer to fish and wildlife um, or use the, the term fish and wildlife to apply to U.S. fish and wildlife or our federal um, colleagues and then folks in the state as fish and game. And it was an easy way to distinguish the two. Now they're both known as fish and wildlife. So it gets it gets confusing. Um, a key uh, a key part of Fish and Wildlife, the Fish and Wildlife is sort of the, the boots on the ground agency. The Fish and Game Commission is the entity that sets policy. How many fish can we take? Um, what's the bear hunting season? Things of that nature. That's the Fish and Game Commission. Wildlife Conservation Board um, is an entity that provides uh, money for the acquisition of land for conservation purposes primarily. Next, we have the California Energy Commission, or what people usually refer to as the CEC. 
a uh, very important agency in terms of things like offshore wind and in terms of our uh, uh, electrical grid, things of that nature. Uh, we mentioned before that we have the Coastal Commission. The Coastal Commission operates everywhere along the state outside of the San Francisco Bay Area, and that's because the San Francisco Bay Area has its own version of the... Co it, it, the counties that touch San Francisco Bay have their own version of the Coastal Commission called the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission. Or committee. Yeah, wait, commit, yeah commission. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so that they do essentially what the Coast Commission does just inside the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, then we have uh, the Department of Conservation, which um, does several things. Not necessarily everything you guys would think of as, as conservation, but um, I think their most important arm is um, used to be known as Dogger, or everybody referred to them as Dogger, now referred to as CalGEM. This is the Geological Energy Management Division. This is the entity that... that uh, maps, tracks, etc., cetera, um, are uh, geological resources, especially in the context of coastal management, oil and gas. And so they're the entity that they're going to um, track abandoned wells, um, things of that nature. Then we obviously have state parks. State parks, super important. A lot of our state beaches, et cetera, uh, or a lot of our beaches are run by the state. Um, uh, they obviously have a purview beyond just uh, the coastal zone, which is, again, why it's gray here. Um, and then uh, another important uh, one, which is a, a bit of a, a bit of another um, multi-level thing here, which is CalFed, which was created by the late uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein um, to uh, pro focus management, provide funding for um, uh, management of the San Francisco Bay Delta. Uh, then we have, uh, we, we used to call, Cal, when I was young, we called it California Forestry and Fire. Uh, now the name is officially Cal Fire because fire has become so important in our state. That's really uh, subsumed the forestry management to a great degree, certainly in terms of budgets for that agency. Um, uh, boating and Waterways uh, does all, so, so while Cal Fire operates primarily in light, probably should have made that gray. Um, uh, uh, increasingly they've come into the coastal zone. And so while we, don't historic, we haven't historically thought of fire as a coastal zone thing, now a lot of their um, highest profile, biggest problem areas are in the coastal zone. So again, that should, that should have been gray. Um, uh, then boating and waterways. This is the uh, agency that um, you know, makes sure people, uh, if you wanted to register your boat, that's, where, that's how you register your boat. Um, safety training, etc. Our boating center in Channel Islands Harbor was funded by um, boating and waterways. Um, and then the Department of Water Resources, which while it operates all across the state, um, also uh, is largely responsible for things like river discharges, etc. into our coastal zone. Okay, now we can talk about um, a, a uh, kind of like special districts. This is sort of along the same lines. This is not exactly um, uh, 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 common or, or required, but we see it more and more. This is this is um, governance or agencies or folks that have influence over the management that are operating between states or, or in an area greater than one particular state. So an example of that would be something like our UNOLS fleet. The UNOLS fleet is a, a collaboration among research organizations across the U.S., um, uh, primarily academic, but not, not 100%, but primarily academic, um, where we have a, a standard for operating ocean-going vessels so that we get a lot of our um, long-term uh, data, uh, et cetera, uh, 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 observations of coastal resources via our UNOS fleet, um, data buoys, things of that nature. And so this is an association across all coastal states in the U.S. Uh, next, we can talk about more um, specific regional ones. So, for example, the West Coast Governor's Agreement on Ocean Health. This is between California, uh, Oregon, and Washington. And this is an agreement uh, that's been in effect for about uh, 25 years now, and it's, it's, it's evolved over the years, but, but the first iteration was about 25 years ago, to have more deliberative and collaborative and uh, effective management of our 
a wider coast and ocean along the Pacific shores of North America. Um, similar to that, we have the West Coast Ocean Tribal Count, uh, Tribal Caucus of, I can't remember the most latest count, something like 35 or, or more tribes that are formerly a part of the caucus um, to provide um, their guidance and their recommendations for uh, management of things up and down the coast, the West Coast. Uh, and then we have something, and so those, those two examples are California, Oregon, and Washington. And then we have examples like the California Electrical, Electricity Coordinating Council, which is for the, a wider swath of the Western U.S., and that's to deal with uh, managing electrical uh, uh, generation and um, uh, powering, uh, moving that electricity around to different areas in the Western U.S., Okay, now we're up to our federal agencies. So, of course, the, the big mothership here would be a National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. Uh, they do all kinds of stuff, and I've only listed a few things here. Um, but uh, perhaps one of their most important ones is what's known as Nash the NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service. This is... Um, uh, Historically, referred to the refer to this as nymphs, or people talk about nymphs. Um, a few years ago, there was a big push to not use that that term and and say and actually have everybody say the the phrase NOAA fisheries that lasted for a little while, and now everybody's gone back to calling them nymphs. Uh, they also uh, are the a very small office, the Office of Coastal Management, but but um, has a, an outsized influence because they require, because of the Coastal uh, Zone Management Act, they um, uh, require states to have coastal management uh, that are touching the ocean to have coastal zone management plans. And so in our state, the primary um, uh, uh, actor there is the Coastal Commission, but, uh, but uh, the Office of Coastal Zone Management is quite important. Um, we also have our Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, which manage, manages our, our federal MPAs. We have our National Estuarine Research Reserve System. Um, those include more uh, National Estuary Research Reserves include Tijuana, um, uh, Morro Bay, San Francisco, et cetera. So these are large estuaries across the U.S. I think there's something like 30, uh, 30, 32, something like that across the U.S. Um, and essentially these are uh, basically salt marshes um, that have a significant value. Uh, then we have NOAA also runs the National Weather Service, fantastically important, amazingly political, or the organization's not political, but it's been an amazing political football over the years where essentially conservative members of Congress have essentially blocked the Weather Service from creating um, effective, engaging websites um, because they uh, are primarily, um, th th there's a big battle for um, folks that want to make money on selling you uh, the free weather data that you your tax dollars pay for. Um, so the National Weather Service is the thing that generates just about all of our weather predictions, et cetera. But they basically are, are strongly discouraged from communicating that to the public. Rather, they put it out in a form that other oftentimes for-profit services um, uh, gather and then distribute. But in any event, National Weather Service is fantastic, uh, leader in the world in terms of satellite monitoring of weather, ocean buoys, etc. Then we have our National Ocean Service, which has a bunch of stuff, but um, perhaps most importantly um, is the entity that looks at uh, the economic value of the, um, the world ocean and communicates uh, the benefit of ocean uh, ecosystem services and things of that nature. Then we have smaller, more specialized offices like the Office of Spill uh, Response and Restoration, which is uh, called upon whenever we have an oil spill. Other agencies include things like U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Department of Transportation, uh, Excuse me. Really important there um, in terms of a whole variety of, of factors, but uh, uh, fragmentation, uh, pollution, all kinds of stuff. Uh, then we have the federal EPA. We're EPA District Nine. Um, uh, the U.S. is carved up into different EPA districts. Our district is um, a pretty uh, powerful one. 
Uh, then we have uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which, while it also operates across the U.S. and outside the coast zone, it primarily, or, or a lot of its uh, most contentious uh, issues and a lot of its energies are in and around the coastal zone. The Army Corps of Engineers is a is a, a funky entity. It, um, it, as the name implies, it's a military organization, and there's there's a military um, uh, governance structure, but all the employees, essentially all the employees are civilians. So it's a, it's a weird chimera. It was born out of the need to clear ports and harbors uh, during the Revolutionary War. Um, and so, so they have a traditional focus uh, on the coast, even though they do dams and other things inland. Then we have um, two agencies that used to be together in what was known as the Minerals Management Service and now has been split into the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and the Bureau of Ocean Safety and Enforcement. So these are the entities that deal with, um, one, uh, Ocean Energy Management is the entity that deals with um, generating energy uh, from offshore resources, so oil and gas, uh, wind, etc., and then the entity that that's in charge of uh, managing or monitoring the impacts and enforcing uh, various regulations on the production of that energy, and that's the Bureau of Safety and Enforcement, also uh, a lot of times referred to as BSEE. Um, and then we have the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, which uh, obviously, uh, well. The coast uh, really captures a lot of their uh, attention during hurricanes, etc. They really operate across the U.S. Then we have um, the intergovernmental level of agencies. Now, this is this, this is um, becoming a little bit uh, a squirrely here. So, so these entities all uh, might influence our management if we were in um, an agreement with them. And so, in some cases, we have an agreement. In some cases, we don't. Um, but uh, even the ones that we don't oftentimes inform our policy, if not, you know, they don't control our policy, but they oftentimes inform how we're going to manage some resources. So there's a gazillion different aid, uh, a gazillion different things we could talk about at the, at the UN, but um, uh, examples of really important ones include the Food and Agricultural Organization. They're the entity that, that captures, amongst other things, uh, the, all the data for the global fisheries. So they're really important for us for understanding a harvest of wild capture and aquacultured um, uh, proteins across the world. Then we have the IMO, or the International Maritime Organization. This is the entity that, that helps us track uh, shipping and provide safety with shipping, deal with, deal with uh, piracy on the high seas, things of that nature. And then while there are many, many agencies in the UN that we can talk about, um, one example, uh, increasingly given the turmoil on our planet where people are leaving one crisis-filled area to try to come to places like Western Europe or the U.S. or Japan or whatever, um, and then uh, and all the problems associated with that, um, this would be the, the U.N. Uh, agency or office for the High Commissioner for Refugees or the UNHCR, as everyone refers to them as. So those are, those are you know, UN agencies proper. Um, then we have entities that were born of the UN, but are essentially, but are not really controlled by the UN anymore. And uh, while while you know they're associated with the UN, they're they're not uh, uh, dictated uh, by the whims of the UN. So that they include uh, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, or the IUCN, which um, is about uh, trying to understand. Uh, conserve and promote uh, biodiversity across the planet. Then we have the super famous IPCC or the Intergover Intergovernmental Panel uh, on Climate Change. Um, this was created by both the, the environmental elements of the UN and um, the uh, International Meteorological Association back in the 90s to provide uh, a clear objective scientific evidence uh, and, and documentation of what was going on with climate change and what might unfold in the future. Now, then we have the World Database on Protected Areas, uh, fantastically important resource. This is domiciled in, in Oxford. 
um, but uh, is really similar to the FAO and the IMO, um, the key area for pulling together data. So, so their, their main value is um, uh, aggregating all the information from various countries, various sources into a, a, a consumable form. And then there's, uh, of course, the International Seabed Authority, which was one of the things that was created out of the uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea. Um, and they are based in Jamaica. Then we can talk about intergovernmental um, um, management uh, guidance that is not the UN, that is created specifically because of um, separate agreements, direct agreements. Now, this could be bilateral, meaning um, uh, one country and another country, trilateral, three countries, or multilateral, meaning several countries get together and agree to stuff. So examples of this include the Trilateral Committee for Wildlife and Ecosystem Conservation and Management. This was born out of, in the early 1900s, uh, first under the Migratory um, uh, Bird Act, or the Migratory Bird Treaty. Um, and this is uh, an, a, a Canada, U.S., and Mexico um, agreements for, for example, how we deal with, my, I, that, that example was migratory uh, birds or waterfowl, but the same could be done for fish or other things, which is, hey, if we just save the critters in Mexico, that's not going to help them if they're also getting whacked by the time they migrate into the U.S., etc. Then we have the International Whaling Commission, uh, a really interesting organization, an important organization that was originally created by whalers so they could keep whaling to, to figure out how to better exploit the, the whale resources and, and make it sustainable. Now it primarily is focused on um, stopping whaling. Uh, and a, a similar example of that would be uh, our regional fishery management. And, and I should say, yeah, yeah, okay. So the International Whaling Commission was, was created by, uh, or it was founded by all the folks that work across um, uh, uh, the seas whaling. Regional fishery management organizations are, are more narrowly focused. So the International Whaling Commission is, is global. The regional fishery management organizations are, are uh, you know, by definition, not the whole planet. And so the best example of this would be the five uh, RMOs that deal with um, tuna, uh, primarily on the high seas. The oldest one of those, the Inter-American Tropical Tuna Commission, um, which was uh, created, um, I think, about 38 years or so ago. Um, anyway, so the, to, to try to provide guidance for harvest of fish. Um, out on the high seas 